Hello and welcome to the Center for Collective Learning. Today I have the pleasure to host uh, Audrey Tang. Uh, Audrey, she is uh, well known as the digital minister of Taiwan. She has uh, been a force in this world of, of digital democracy, of the use of new technologies in organizing, communicating, and participating in, in novel ways. I think it's it's really interesting to, to hear from her because there are only a few examples of experiences in which digital efforts have been fully become part of a government. You know, the case of Taiwan um, and Audrey is, is one of them. We've had other cases in the seminar too, like the we had the Five Star Movement people here with the Rousseau platform a few weeks ago. We had Diago Bermejo with the City of Madrid and we had Colin Megal who has also collaborated with Audrey in the past. But I think today, you know, the focus is now more towards the East, more towards Taiwan and to the work that Audrey has done. So Audrey, the floor is yours. We are very happy to hear from you. Excellent. So I'll share my screen. Um, and uh, we'll see if you can see some cute dogs. If you do see some cute dogs, then it works. Oh, okay, I see the dogs, yeah. Uh, excellent. They're, they're all images of the same dog. <laughs> Name's Zong Chai, uh, the Shiba Inu. Uh, and here the dog is saying, keep three Shibas away, uh, indoor or wear a mask, uh, outdoor two Shiba or wear a mask. Um, remember to cover your mouth in as soon sneezing. Uh, this one is saying, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand, uh, and so on. Uh, and this uh, is a strategy called humor over rumor. Um, you see, as the digital minister in charge of social innovation, uh, we're working on ways uh, to solve structural issues, for example, countering the infodemic with no takedown. And how do you counter infodemic, which is the overloading of mis and dis and mal information during the pandemic? Uh, well, you will use humor over rumor because it turns out that people really need uh, contextualizing services when it comes to disinformation. And in Taiwan, we have this idea called digital public infrastructure that provide a collective intelligence that's pro-social rather than anti-social um, in our public discussions. One case in point. Um, our, uh, and this is the easy to uh, memorize uh, principles, fast, fair, and fun. Um, so what, what you're looking at is the PTT. Uh, it's uh, sometimes referred to as Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit. Um, and uh, and I, I see some uh, commentary on the chat, which is great. Keep it coming. You can ask questions uh, anytime during the chat as well. Um, so uh, collective intelligence relies on a pro-social platform. And PTT, unlike Reddit, doesn't have any advertisers. It doesn't have any shareholders either. This is a 25 years old uh, student pet project from National Taiwan University, 100% uh, subsidized by the Taiwan Academic Network. Uh, so state funded uh, and university run. Uh, uh, and entirely in the social sector, it doesn't um, need to sell advertisement. So when in 2019, uh, last day of 2019, when Dr. Li Wenliang's message uh, from Wuhan get reposted on PTT, as it probably did on other social media, uh, only the PTT um, triaged this message, which said, and I quote, there were seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market, end of quote. Um, and so by the time that our Center for Disease Control look at a very well put together triage of this message, uh, they have sufficient clues to start health inspection for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. And that uh, has an immediate result because Taiwan so far had less than 20 COVID deaths um, in total. Uh, and so it allowed us to respond in a very quick manner. And so this says to me two things. First, the citizens trust the government enough to talk about the SARS epidemic publicly uh, in a way without fearing that they will get quote unquote harmonized, uh, which is kind of rare actually in our part of the world. According to the Civicus Monitor, Taiwan is the only jurisdiction with a completely free freedom of speech, assembly, and so on environment. And the other thing it tells me is the government also trusts the citizens so that the collective intelligence, when they triage an incoming emergent um, message with the full context, we can act on it very quickly. We have this uh, single toll-free number 1922 uh, that everybody can call uh, since mid-January for everything related to the pandemic. As of today, uh, you can also send SMS to it 
for the check-in uh, service and contact tracing. So this service is very useful because it's toll free, both SMS and phone calls, uh, and people just called with their ideas and new emergent issues. Um, for example, last April, uh, this day, they have this uh, call from a very young boy who called saying, you're rationing out masks and all I get is pink medical grade masks. But all the boys in my class had navy blue ones. So I don't want to wear pink to school, um, said the boy. Well, it got escalated uh, by the participation officer, uh, the team of people in each ministry uh, in charge of engaging with emerging hashtags. So the participation officer of the Ministry of Health and Welfare suggested uh, Minister Chen Shizhong of Health and Welfare, as well as all the medical officers in a daily 2 p.m. press conference, all wear pink medical masks. And um, Chen Shizhong even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero, uh, which means I guess that the boy became the most hip boy in the class, for only he had the color that the heroes wear and heroes hero wear. Uh, and so this is a communication style that says everyone's business requires everyone's help. It also pertains to fairness. For example, when we started rationing masks, that's at the end of January uh, last year, January 31st, there was a couple of public service people um, working in epidemiology, uh, also from National Taiwan University, I believe, uh, and um, Professor Fang Sitai and Chen Yushen, uh, discovered from the early report uh, from Wuhan and I believe also Italy, uh, that uh, the R value of this new strain of SARS actually could be controlled to be under one if three quarters of people in any district, in any neighborhood uh, wear a mask and wash their hands. If they don't, there will be pockets of community transmission. But if everybody does that across the whole country, then our value will be under one and we will see the cases dwindle. And after a couple of weeks, we will again eliminate the virus. That's their discovery. Um, and so after that, we started thinking about how to make the mask uh, at the time, Taiwan manufactured about 2 million medical masks a day, but we have 23 million. So what to do? Well, we have universal broadband and universal health care. So the national health insurance people as well as the people in the so civil society, the civic technologists, they collaborated on something called the real name mask rationing system. And this system, uh, as you can see, uh, shows in real time with more than 100 different tools, the availability of medical grade masks in nearby pharmacies. So people don't have to queue in vain and people who queue in line can uh, check their phone and within a couple minutes at most, they will see exactly how many masks are left in that pharmacy so they can go somewhere else uh, if it's running out of masks. It also enabled people to independently analyze the mask distribution uh, algorithm. So for example, uh, MP Gao Hongan, uh, previously VP of data analytics uh, in Foxconn, so she knows something about data, using uh, the OpenStreetMap community's uh, data, which you can see here is a visualization, calculated that the mask map as shown by the government initially uh, had a data bias. We said the population centers overlap almost exactly with the availability of mask and we think it's fair. But she said, not everybody own a helicopter. Well, paraphrase, but that, uh, that's what she meant. So the, with the distance on the map does not actually mean the accessibility of masks in pharmacies. In very rural places, maybe they have to take a couple hours for public transportation to carry them to a pharmacy that looks close on the map. Um, and so when she interpolated Minister Chen Shizhong, uh, Minister Chen simply said, well, legislator teach us. Again, because we had this open API, we actually co-created the algorithm and MPGA was very happy and said, well, yesterday's interpolation become tomorrow's algorithm, become tomorrow's deployment. And that enabled us to then deploy the mask rationing both on the more fair way and also enable pre-ordering in all the four convenience stores not even a month after the initial uh, design. Uh, and so uh, this is our premier, Su Zhen Chang, smiling very happily because that is, uh, I think, around March to April, where we actually reached 75% medical mask uh, coverage thanks to the pre-ordering system. And also, as I mentioned, the pandemic makes people anxious. 
And so how to make people uh, feel that they can contribute to fact checking to more pro-social activities that requires humor over room. <clears throat> also last April, there was a um, shortage of tissue papers. And the tissue papers um, um, rumor was, um, it's running out because the state confiscate tissue paper material to make masks. Of course, that's not true. Uh, but how do we dispel the rumor without any takedown? Well, the premier, which you just saw from the previous slide, shows his backside on a very popular internet meme just a couple of hours after the disinformation uh, went viral. And this meme went even more viral. This meme said, each of us only have one pair of bottoms. It's a wordplay because uh, in Mandarin, to stockpile twin sounds the same as bottoms twin. So basically he's saying you can't use that many anyway. Uh, and then a table that says tissue papers are made out of um, paper, which is um, South American material. <clears throat> but unlike toilet papers, medical grade masks are made out of plastic and it's domestic material. So there's no way that uh, producing one uh, will affect the um, supply of the other. Uh, and this one absolutely viral, has a higher R value than the original disinformation. So within just a couple of days, the uh, panic buying died down uh, and we solved the situation without resorting to censorship. And a very cute dog, Spokes Dog Zong Chai, also helps by explaining, for example, mask use. Uh, this picture is saying, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. <clears throat> Again, this is very easy to share and very easy to remember. And so using this internet meme, internet culture, and so on, it's like vaccination of the mind so that people become shielded from the revenge or discrimination um, um, effect, right? Emotions uh, when they face those uh, social media posts. And people even banded together uh, and build a website entirely through crowdsourcing crowdfunding called Taiwan Can Help That Us that explains our measures and also uh, shows the people who dedicate their medical grade mask rationing to the people around the world for humanitarian aid. Again, that was very much needed uh, last April. So how do we get uh, to know this disinformation is going viral, right? So within 60 minutes, as I mentioned on average, we roll out this very funny meme. This is another example. Um, unrelated to COVID, before COVID, there was a popular rumor that says, if you perm your hair many times a week, you get a million dollar fine. What? Right, but, but it's not true. And again, the premier rolled out this picture saying, I may be bald now, says a young premier but I will not punish people who look like my youth. And then a fine print saying, labeling requirement for hair products takes effect July, 2021. But this one, uh, Premier Su, as he looks now says, well, but if you perm your hair many times a week, it would damage your hair, if not your bank account. Just look at me now for what will happen to your hair. Again, this is very funny. He, he literally makes himself butt of the joke, uh, but this went far more viral than the original disinformation. So again, the disinformation gets calmed down. And so the detection, much like how people flag incoming messages as spam, we rely on the Gov0 or G0V community, the same bunch of people who work on the mask rationing map uh, to produce, for example, the Cofax community and bots. So you can forward any instant message that you receive that you think might or might not be a deep fake uh, or a disinformation or a scam, and then you forward to the service and people just like Wikipedia, they can collaboratively fact check and contextualize it. And we have a public dashboard that says which one are the most viral. And the most viral one receive a fact checking from professional journalists at Taiwan Fact Check Center, which is independent, not belonging to any party or government. And then they publish the reports. And so uh, we also work, of course, with Facebook and other media to make sure that you can't pay them to influence fact checking. So for example, during our election, advertisement for uh, social and political issues, they can't use uh, payment as a um, um, workaround to the real-time fact checking. Uh, it needs to be treated as political contributions published again in real-time open data and the funding must not come from non-domestic sources. So a couple of examples. There was a popular disinformation that said, and I quote, 
Hong Kong sex compensation experts kill a police and see you up to 20 million, uh, which was quite trending in 2019, uh, November, right before the pandemic. And that's because it's also right before the presidential election. And this issue is turning up to be the most influential issue in our presidential election. And so instead of taking anything down, we just did a notice and public notice. We noticed that this picture is from the Reuters and the Taiwan Fact Check Center saw that this alternate caption, the original um, caption said nothing about killing police or getting fu funded, right? This only said there's teenage protesters. But the alternate caption says, and I quote, this 13 year old thug bought new iPhones. And so um, they traced the original post of this to the Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei Chang'an Jian or the Chang'an Sword of the People's Republic of China regime's uh, central political and law unit. And so instead of taking anything down, <clears throat> we just put a mandatory frame on all sort of social media that when people share this picture, they see this mandatory frame. And because this is crowdsourced and contextualized, uh, it's not about party affiliation or anything, people's media competence increased. And competence, not just literacy, is the most important thing because competence is about ability to participate. Um, during our election, another popular disinformation, and I quote, the CIA made two special vis invisible ink for ballots. So no matter who you vote, your ink disappear. No matter who you vote, the ink for uh, President Tsai Ing-wen appears. And so Tsai always wins. And of course, that's of course not true. But how do we dispel that? Well, with the YouTubers. Um, unlike many other countries, uh, we use a pure paper-based balloting counting system and we invite YouTubers with their own apps so each major political party has its own app for tallying. And when each uh, ballot is taken out, they're allowed to film it and to just make it part of their show. And so even if you don't trust the YouTuber of the other party, you probably trust the YouTuber of the political party you like. And so when all the um, uh, tallying agree, and so everything here um, gets um, tallied together, and you can triage the numbers uh, between the various different parties, YouTubers, in each and every counting station. And so when they agree, uh, there really was no uh, way for the rumor to spread. And finally, uh, during uh, February, Musk can't be bought with money now. Uh, manufacturers want to sell 2,000 box. Get a box for free by sharing this post. But if you do share the post, you get no mask, but some computer virus. Uh, and so again, this is solved not by taking down, but by radical transparency. As I mentioned, a radically transparent real-time map just put this disinformation to rest. And so I see this information as something um, much like the epidemic itself. We need to achieve universal broadband just like universal health coverage in Taiwan. So everybody can participate in the contextualizing service and watch live streams at no marginal cost and start live streams. We need to support the civic technologies uh, that develop the ways for these contextualizing services to work together in a pro-social rather than anti-social way. And we also need to quarantine, for example, during the election, money coming in from uh, outside of our jurisdiction uh, that try to influence uh, via political advertisement. So that's the counter infodemic. And the underlying principle of social innovation uh, is one that, and I quote Dr. Tsai Ing wen when she was first inaugurated in 2016, she said, and I quote, before we think of democracy as a showdown between two opposing values, but from now on, democracy must become a conversation between many diverse values. And indeed, this is my office in the social innovation lab. Every design is about co-creation. This soccer field, for example, is co-designed by people with Down syndrome, with trisomy differences. So when they paint the world that they see, it's like Van Gogh's painting, it gets people into the mood of co-creation. When people bring, for example, these are some self-driving vehicles from 2016, um, we started this living lab and people look at it, they don't feel threatened because it's very slow, it can't really hurt anyone, uh, but it's open source and open data. So people try to repurpose it instead of as um, tricycles, they want to use them as shopping carts. And for this to be used as shopping carts, so you can shop hand-free during the Jingle Flower Market uh, trip near the Social Innovation Lab, you have to get the two eyes, not just one, show the person they're following and so on. And this is about norm creation. Once the social sector sets the norm, 
or the technology. Then it's a role for the public sector to work with those norms so the private sector understand how to work with the people, public, private partnership to innovate conforming to the social norm. And in SDG terms, this is effective partnership. Now, of course, uh, how to build effective partnership, it has to start from the very top. So every year we have a presidential hackathon where we highlight out of 200 or so uh, different social innovations, five innovations of the year. And they receive a trophy, it's a shape of Taiwan and with a micro projector underneath. If you project, uh, it project after time when handing you the trophy. So it's a self-describing trophy, it's a very meta. Uh, but this symbolizes that the president will make your idea public policy for the entire nation within the next year, as soon as possible, actually, with all the budgetary, legal, and personnel requirements. And so this prompts cross-sectoral collaboration like no other. As you know, Taiwan is currently suffering from a water shortage. But in 2017 already, we work on this problem using this sort of presidential hackathon as a platform to train the chatbots so that they can talk to the water repair people of the possible pipe leaks close to them and so this target is 6.4. All the presidential hackathon winners have to conform to one or more of the sustainable development goals, which uh, was started uh, in Jilong, a small city, but because they won the presidential hackathon, they expanded all across Taiwan. Even they work with Wellington, the New Zealand um, Wellington Water Company to also solve the sim similar problem for New Zealand. And each of the case brings a new data collaborative where the social sector sets the norm the public sector sets how the value added services conform to the norm and then the economic sector then work on those services uh, to ensure reliable data is held accountable mutually by everyone. For climate science, for example, to achieve net zero, we need to get people to actually care about the environment as much as possible. So more than 2000, actually around tens of thousands now, um, air boxes was set up as part of this data collaborative. Um, actually, um, most of these are from primary school students. They learn about data competence, not literacy, by maintaining a small IoT device that take talks uh, over 0G and BIoT usually, that measures say PM 2.5 or other uh, weather measures and rise to a shared distributed ledger so that everybody can um, see what the environment situation is going on. And this is an educational tool because it's impossible to teach, say, data controllership, uh, stewardship in GDPR. It's so abstract. But if you own an airbox, this becomes very easy to teach. And so what we're saying here is that once we make sure it's an educational tool for sustainable development and global partnership and citizenship, this makes possible for everyone to join the problem solving team. So public trust, of course, is a common good as witnessed uh, in the Q&A uh, box. Now, um, AI stands for something different here. When it empowers collective intelligence, we call it augmented collective intelligence or ACI or AI times CI. So AI plays an assistive role. You can also call it assistive intelligence and it works with collective intelligence so that the community can sense the issues together instead of the AI at its own replacing human role. We don't do that. We put AI in a connecting human role. Again, this is illustrated best by our social innovation tours, which I tour around Taiwan to the most rural places, remote islands, talk to them there, all the while connecting to the central government in the social innovation lab. So we seem to be there in the same virtual uh, room. This has been going on for years, uh, even before the pandemic, that also increased our pandemic readiness because anywhere in Taiwan, the rural place I visit, if they don't have 10 megabits per, uh, per second for just 16 euros, unlimited, then it's my fault personally. Uh, and so people do hold me to account. We actually had a couple of months ago, some guy in a quarantine place writing an email to me saying, Minister Tong, it took me half a day to write this email. I must report to you that I'm suffering a human right violation because you said broadband is a human right. I get very spotty connection on this uh, site close to the Yangming Mountains in my quarantine place. Do something about it. 
And so within a couple of weeks, we set up a new telecom tower uh, near that place. Of course, by the time he's out of the quarantine, but he made a point of driving back and measure with speed test and share it on social media uh, to show that he actually held me to account. And this is very important because without this uh, commitment to universal broadband and universal health and universal education, we can't really get this competence-based co-creation going. So again, this is responsive, inclusive, and representative decision-making. And the sandboxes, again, illustrate this idea. The sandbox, for example, when Uber first came to Taiwan, they tried to work with people who has no professional driver's license. And it, the debate became very um, abstract, like whether it's sharing economy, whether it's not, it's platform economy, whether it's gig economy and so on. Uh, I'm sure that uh, in Paris and many other cities, people in, in that year, 2015, had pretty much the same conversation. But in Taiwan, we use AI in a assistive role. So we power the conversation of consultation with AI. So this is my friends and families in the actual UberX conversation in 2015. Uh, and they have very different sentiments on the same data. So we first share the facts. Here are the facts. And then we ask for a couple of weeks, actually three to four weeks, what do you feel? There could be no right or wrong about feelings. You may feel happy, they may feel angry, it's all okay. And the ideas at the end of the three or four weeks gradually emerge, and then we can take these as the norms. So in practice, POLIS or PLL.IS, uh, nowadays it's our infrastructure, so POLIS.GOV.TW works like this. Um, you see a sentiment from your fellow citizen. I think passenger liability very important. If you agree, if you click agree, you move toward me. If you disagree, you move um, af afar. And you see another sentiment, another sentiment, and you upvote, downvote, upvote, downvote. But then upvote only moves you to the people who feel similar to you. It doesn't really push that uh, idea away. Actually, if you downvote a lot of um, sentiments, you join the people who downvote these sentiments too. And it doesn't have a reply button. And with no reply button, there's no way for troll to grow. The troll simply cannot command the attention that they need. And this is measured by diversity of sentiment, not by headcount. So even if you get 2,000 people here voting exactly the same way, there may be an extra zero here, but the area do not increase. And we say, we only hold ourselves to account to answer in face-to-face -face consultation that's broadcasted the consensus statements. We ignore, we acknowledge by ignore the divisive statements, the ideologies. So people discover for the first time that most of us agree with most of our neighbors on most of the things, most of the time. It's just the social media was so antisocial. It's like we had a discussion in a very loud nightclub, toxic or at least addictive drinks. Uh, loud music have to shout to get heard. Private bouncers um, filled with smoke, can't see very well. And try to hold a town hall there. Uh, and that's simply not a very good idea. So basically we build a digital equivalent of town halls, public library, public museum, and things like that, and held binding conversation there and only there. So we um, regulated Uber by co-creating the regulation. And nowadays Uber is the local Taiwan taxi fleet, uh, but we changed the taxi fleet regulation. So local co-ops, even local church and temples can also organize serving for their uh, more marginal community, something like Uber. So this is measure of progress, key uh, measures of progress, KPIs. But what's key is co-created via AI-based consultation. And this is the only way that can work with the various sectors in the community toward common goals. So to close my opening speech, I will uh, say in 2016, when I first became digital minister, the uh, people in HR asked me what's my job description because Taiwan had no digital minister before me. I say, oh, it's very easy. It's just 17, 18, 17, 17, 17, 6. In other words, reliable data, effective partnership, and open innovation. And the uh, HRPO are like, I'm not sure our citizen memorized the 169 SDG goals um, in their mind. Uh, and so I'm like, okay, let me translate that to plain language. And so I'll read you now my job description, and then we can get some Q&A going. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. 
We see machine learning. Let's make it collaborative learning. Or we see user experience. Let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear the singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Audrey. That was a great presentation. I love all of the more recent work that you showed in um, battling misinformation, which is a, a really big issue, not only in Taiwan, of course, everywhere. So I do have like a few questions and I think there's people that are starting to ask questions themselves and we're gonna invite them to the stage soon. Uh, one question that was also asked by someone and, and I think uh, is particularly important to our audience is that when, when you tell these stories, you know, I, I think there's two things that are very salient. On the one hand, there's the technological aspect, but on the other hand, I think like to me, what is the biggest contrast is the institutional environment in which you seem to be, you know, it seems to be an environment of, you know, of trust, of respect. I'm sure that there are some frictions, you know, uh, but it's an environment that, that it seems a little bit far from, you know, what we sometimes experience, you know, here, you know, in, in, in the West where, where that divisiveness is, is searched, exploited, used, you know, like, a, a, like divisions are not used to, to find differences and, and build and find solutions, but to kind of like, beat rivals, you know, thinking of a world in which, in which you can, is you can eventually, uh, you know, win without including the other ones. And, and like my, my, my first question to you is about that, about like that environment. It seems that you have a trust environment or, a, or a, an environment that institutionally is very positive where these technologies have been able to be used in these assistive, uh, virtuous ways, you know? But many of us uh, are or have been or, or, or are traumatized by being in environments that uh, institutionally are very different. And what, what would you say about that? How, how can we help develop that trust? You know, is the technology something that can help? Is there some experience that you have there of low trust interactions, you know, and how to navigate them? Sure. So um, I will share this picture. This is me. Uh, and this is Grandma Young. Um, I talk about how we co-developed this pre-ordering system where you can take um, your mask either from a pharmacy or pre-order them in a convenience store. That was last uh, April, I believe. So last March, when we were developing this system, we um, checked with the elderly people, the senior people, on what makes them comfortable. Because it's, if it's not comfortable to them, it doesn't matter how convenient it is. They would not feel comfort uh, in doing so. So universal broadband is just the beginning. We, we need to make a safe space in the digital realm for all the digital services that we do. And so I work with my own grandmother, who is 88 years old now, um, saying we're going to introduce the convenience store pre-ordering for mask, so you can pre-order it in the nearby family mart, uh, like two minutes walk, three minutes walk, instead of taking public transportation to the nearby pharmacy, which is considerably farther, um, maybe half an hour uh, or even one hour of travel and a bit of queuing too. And she's like, okay, uh, but I'm too old. Um, I will introduce you to my younger friends uh, who are complaining about queuing in pharmacies all day long. So this is Grandma Young, her younger friend, who is 77 years old at the time. Um, and I worked with Grandma Young uh, on the flow. And she immediately, upon looking at the instruction that uh, the ATM, the automated teller machine, which is in pretty much all the convenience store, is used to wire about two euros to the Center for Disease Control in exchange for a receipt that you can redeem for Musk. She said, I will never use it. She said, if I type my password wrong, maybe I will wire all my saving to the CDC. I don't trust the ATM, she said. And also, what about people who are queuing after me? What if they look at my password? Maybe they will wire my savings out. And so instead of going for the convenience, we in immediately change track. So she can use the same universal health card in the kiosk and count in coins 
even during the pandemic in coins <laughs> to the counter. So she feels safe about the payments. And then of course you can use other sort of payments, but this is important because the flow feels the same as going to the pharmacy, which felt the same as her getting the uh, refillable prescriptions uh, every month because she had a chronic condition and so on. So basically each step, we make sure the experience is the same for the senior people. They don't have to learn a lot more. And so that is why when we introduce digital system, we always said they have to work with, not for the people. And they must join the social norm, not asking people to adapt to it. I think that's the crucial difference between a more top-down approach, which lose trust very quickly, and a peer-to-peer -peer approach where we first work with the citizen, eventually after the citizens, where the trust is earned in a trustworthy way. Thank you. And I have another question, uh, which is, it's, you know, it's not about concept, but more a little bit about the history. And you showed at some point in your presentation, you know, the use of police, and that's a famous story, you know, like the, the use of police during the sunflower movement and the, you know, uh, and the Uber drivers. Uh, how did you you know, find out about the tool because I, when I when I talked to Colin, he told me you know originally they developed it for the Occupy movement, you know, in 2011. And so, so what what's the story? How does police get from the United States and from this group of people, you know, to to Taiwan and to you and and then mm -hmm. you know to the larger community? Um, the story is very simple. Uh, we're all part of the Occupiers Network, right? We occupy our parliament in 2014 in demonstration uh, against the sudden ratification without deliberation of the cross-strait uh, trade agreement with Beijing. Uh, at the time, the demo uh, was not the traditional sense of a demo for protest. It's a demo as in a software demo. We, we actually showed how this sort of tools of listening at scale can get half a million people on the street and many more online to deliberate substantially on the trade agreement and agree on four demand and not one less after three weeks of nonviolent occupy, which was then ratified by the head of the parliament. So it was a successful occupy. And so right after the sunflower movement, all the public service want to learn how to listen at scale. And at the time, through the um, Occupy Network, we invite many occupiers uh, to Taiwan for the GovZero Summit. Uh, and among them uh, are the people who work on, say, Lumio, uh, on Polis, on many other um, deliberation tools online. And so we had people introducing these ideas. Uh, and Polis um, is particularly useful because it's designed uh, to be scale-free, meaning that it's good for 100, but also for 1,000 tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and so the civic uh, sector really needs that because we don't have a lot of moderators. We're all part-timers, right? We're, we're all volunteers. We can't moderate tens of thousands of people coming in uh, and then we will lose the moderation wall, right? Even if we have this course or Wikipedia, uh, we're simply outnumbered. So Polis is an automated moderation tool that have the crowd moderate itself for pro-social conversation. And so we try it out first on a few community related cases. And then we work with the minister at the time, Jacqueline Tsai, on the Uber X case to much success. And after that, we convinced Colin to open source it because that's the requirement for it to be our public infrastructure. And then we contribute to the localization, integrated login, cybersecurity, we hide professional penetration testers, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that now is polis.gov.tw. Great. We, we started to invite some of the people that have been asking questions to, to come and meet you. And um, we have Nils Roch. Um, it's a long last name. So, so I guess, you know, you, you pronounce it before I butcher it. Uh, Nils, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nils Hochovich, but don't, don't worry if you can't pronounce it. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. That was really enlightening. Uh, my, my question is on basically, it, it sounds from your approach that, or from your talk that your approach is taking care of many things like actually sort of personally. And that's normally an approach that doesn't scale well to running an entire country. So how do you do that? Or uh, or what's your support system that allows you to scale that to, to such a large operations? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is a great question. So I firmly believe if I don't test uh, and use uh, a new digital service from end to end, then I can't really um, work with the people. 
I will be working for the people, <laughs> like many, uh, many steps removed. Uh, of course, I don't personally write every line of code. So the trick here is to procure preferring open API. Each um, system, software system in Taiwan procured in our government contract, and I bet in your government too, if a vendor says um, they can only support sighted people and not people with blindness, then they get disqualified immediately because accessibility is a core requirement. But in our contract template since 2016, we have this clause that said, if you support only human interaction with the system and not open API, which is machine to machine interaction with other open source components, then you could be also disqualified for discriminating against robots. Well, we don't quite say that, but that's, that's what it means. Right? So it means that each system is like a Lego block. Each system can be repurposed. So I personally had uh, our experience in designing, for example, the tax filing system. And in 2017, we did a complete redesign with a petitioner that said the old system was, end of quote, explosively hostile, end of quote. But the system was pro procured in a way with open API. So during the pandemic, we repurposed that for mask pre-ordering in just three days. And then later on, we purposed that for stimulus voucher pre-ordering in just three days. And in the past three days, we repurposed that into an SMS-based check-in system for contact tracing. Uh, and so the trick is that I can't personally, of course, work with each new system. But in some sense, it's not the new system. It's an open source community setting new norms for us to adjust for the parameters of the existing cybersecurity well-tested system for some additional purpose. And so the trick here is that the civil society already have a very great way of setting the norm that's open source. All it needs is a cybersecurity team that reviews this and a good defense at depth team so that we can deploy Collins code with confidence. Thank you. Great. It's great capacity. I, I think it's a luxury to be able to have, you know, like people with the capacity to implement these these solutions, you know, and, and and working together. So, kudos for that, and hopefully we can replicate those things in other places. And we have Austin next. Okay, thanks a lot. And th thanks for a really inspiring presentation. That was very stimulating. Um, I, I had two questions actually, but let, let me let let me make them very brief, and you can decide which one you want to spend more time on. First question is about moving public officials towards this paradigm that you've developed of kind of mm -hmm. radical transparency and digital openness. Mm -hmm. So I think we, we can all see that this is not a widespread, uh, you know, paradigm in public officials worldwide. And uh, you must have spent some time trying to convince people that it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could, you know, give us a window on how you how you were able to convince public officials that were probably you know mm -hmm. used to top down planning or, or were risk averse and so on you managed to convince them that this was this was good second question is about the contributions that you get from from public uh contribute from from citizens um it sounds like the as cesar had already raised actually that the, the contributions have been very positive constructive you have a trustful environment um, so you answered that previously with reference to this, you know, uh, machine and grandma Yang and so on. But maybe there's something more to do also with in, empowering good solutions when they happen, kind of raising these things up. Um, I, I, I'm just trying to read between the lines of your presentation, but maybe you have a, a strategy for how to make the contributions be so positive and kind of constructive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or right. That, not, and you just, you know, the, the second question is answered by the three pillars of fast, fear, and fun, uh, and they are not, um, they, 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 they can't be traded uh, with one another. It has to be fast and fair and fun uh, for citizens' participation. Imagine the young boy about the pink mask. If we gave him a really good answer, but only sixty days later. That's f fair and fun, but it's not fast anymore, right? Uh, and so if you're fast, fair and fun, then it creates a positive cycle of openness and empowerment because people feel free to point out our mistake and we're like, yeah, sorry, we're wrong, your way is better, let's do that next week. Uh, and, and so that uh, empower them to propose even more serious ideas and devote more of their energy into co-creation. So that's the second question. The first question, well, uh, it's entirely voluntary. 
my office is secondments from each ministry. Uh, each ministry can send up to one person. Uh, so we have <clears throat> a senior contact tracer actually <clears throat> now because we're working with contact tracing tools from Ministry of Health and Welfare. Uh, we have somebody from the National Communication for uh, Communication Commission uh, working with the telecoms and so on uh, of culture, interior, um, finance, uh, um, foreign service for public diplomacy, um, among other things, uh, justice and so on. Uh, but we don't have anyone from the Ministry of Defense. Uh, for obvious reasons, or National Security Council, for obvious reasons. Um, because if they're not happy with radical transparency as a norm, I I'm not asking them to. So basically, each ministry sends the comments to me on the part of the ministry that um, benefits from being radically transparent. That is to say, uh, it requires people to understand the science of it for it to work. Epidemiology, uh, counter-pandemic, counter-infodemic, uh, counter-climate uh, change. Can climate change be countered? Mitigate climate change <laughs> and so on. Uh, and so these are, are the typical tools, but to counter foreign missiles, probably not crowdsourcing, right? So, so these uh, topics are determined uh, entirely by the ministries and we're not forcing anything on them. Thank you, great questions, great answers. Um, Shoshiant, uh, please join us. You know, I know that you're joining from, from a very different time zone in California, no? Maybe it's late at night, so Shant. Are you there? Joy. Hi, Cesar. It's hey. really early uh, here. <laughs> or late. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, Audrey, my name is Sushant. I, I run a, uh, a crowdsourcing and uh, civic innovation platform called Sway. Uh, we're sort of taking a different approach, trying to uh, use AI to help people write better quality proposals so that mm -hmm. they can be heard by more people mm -hmm. uh, and use the filtering functions of crowdsourcing to escalate those proposals to a decision-making level. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been implementing this inside companies as well as uh, for different uh, governments. Our, our latest uh, implementation has been with the UN Secretary General's office and Mm -hmm. The uh, presidential um, crowdsourcing uh, initiative that you, you, you referenced really caught my mind. I was wondering uh, what sort of success you've seen uh, sort of from that um, initiative. Were there ideas or proposals that mm -hmm. made it to the agenda that were not thought of before through that process? Yeah, a, a, a lot, a lot, yes. The, the champions I, I paced uh, here uh, to the chat. And you can check out about domestic viola violence prevention, um, one-stop rescue services, um, um, patch by planting, that's a crowdsource civic planning tool for planting trees. Circuit Plus, that's an interactive map for people to refill their bottles instead of buying new plastic bottles, and all the while getting push notification for possible heat damage, <clears throat> and also checking in, uh, earn some coins they can redeem for local agricultural products and have a conversation with the cultural workers and social workers there. And so it's a multi-purpose tool. Uh, and so basically, uh, and it's shaped like a Pokemon Go game. Um, and so the, the point here is about the cross-sectoral collaboration. That is to say, the presidential hackathon enabled uh, the people who made the cut to top 20 to work with the people who did not make the top 20 cuts by discovering using a novel voting mechanism called quadratic voting, we can discover mm. synergy between uh, all the teams. So once we determine the top 20, the other teams learn also the synergy with the top 20. So they disband and join the top 20. Uh, to make uh, such multi-purpose tools. Um, and so I think this is a great design and it's not possible if you have a zero sum or negative sum voting mechanism. Hmm. Thank you. Amit, are, are you there? Do you, could you please turn on yeah. your camera if it's okay or? Um, you're comfortable? Can I ask? Sure. Uh, am I audible? Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, Audrey, uh, 
why uh, do you think that uh, you uh, should be regulating uh, apps like uber instead of building their parallel alternatives built by people themselves and uh, which they can themselves code and the riders themselves can set their own prices and the um, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, combined it with um, like uh, mandating vehicles to be on road which are idle in the homes of people uh, who have multiple cars at their homes. Um, like um, uh, vehicles require a lot of energy and uh, a lot of uh, carbon is emitted for manufacturing them. So it isn't it's the um, duty of the state to um, um, provide mechanisms so that uh, vehicles uh, which use uh, a lot of energy to be built uh, are used a lot of time instead of just sitting idle. And one more thing that um, such vehicles, such transportation system, um, if uh, you could um, connect many cars on the roads and collect data simultaneously, it, would, it won't be like surveillance state because uh, we already uh, use a lot of data to um, when we drive ourselves manually because we uh, constantly judge the vehicles in front of us how, how fast they are going and uh, oh, who might be driving it and uh, how reckless the driver in front of us is uh, what's the age of the person mm, like is there a kid on the vehicle uh, these kind of data are already collected why uh, we why can't we use it it in a a digital manner and uh, um, provide a transportation system that's free for everyone and uh, uh, is not uh, and because it's basically a human right to be able to travel wherever people want uh, and uh, currently the rich people can travel from us to taiwan and anywhere else within uh, within hours and uh, other people like migrants they they don't have this ability and uh, while the current humanity has made, um, has provided us with this a lot of benefits uh, 21st century benefits they these are not available to people if the collective intelligence um, can't be used to um, serve these kind of interests to people uh, who don't currently have cars or like uh, who don't who can't use apps like delivery apps so i think that collective intelligence can be used to democratize this power and um and uh, uh, give agency to people who don't already have agency in building the digital uh, at digital um ecosystem that we are building um thank you amit uh, audrey Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll check my understanding. Uh, it's basically two different things you're saying from what I hear. The first is about equity, right? Um, of course, there are a lot of private sector services, but they don't serve the public in the sense that they don't serve people who don't pay them. Uh, and there's a limitation of the kind of people who can pay them. Uh, and you're arguing that for basic rights, such as transportation, but many other things, health, education, and so on, uh, there need to be a socialized solution. So, so that's uh, my understanding of your first part of your argument. Uh, and the second part of your argument um, is about uh, if someone doesn't even have the digital capacities, then even if there are such socialized digital public infrastructure, they are still being excluded from it. Uh, and am I right in getting the, the uh, basic idea? Yes, uh, yes. And also that uh, people don't have agency to build those ecosystems themselves. Uh, uh, we are reliant on people like Mark Zuckerberg, like uh, Zeph Bezos, to, uh, who are super rich and uh, have never used uh, uh, these services themselves. Like uh, Uber um, CEO want to use Uber to uh, get from one place to another place. Uh, Maybe, uh, maybe they, they use Uber Air, but but point taken, okay. So, which is a uh, helicopter. But anyway, so um, I, I think the point here, uh, and very well made point is that if we design only for user experience and not human experience or humanity experience, then the design is hostile to people who are not quote unquote users. 
And if we measure engagement only by the time spent on any particular application, forgetting about the uh, complete human experience, then we're basically manufacturing addictiveness and actually in, uh, encouraging antisocial behavior, which is the one of the arguments surveillance capitalism, the book, uh, is making. Um, and, and so uh, I totally agree with the, uh, this analysis. And I think one of the uh, way out, simply put, is that to recognize there are like health, learning and transportation um, constitutionally in Taiwan, they are state functions. They must be implemented in a, a way with equity. In Taiwan, it's actually cheaper to get the mask, the full diagnosis uh, from the nearby clinic if you develop COVID-like symptoms, it's cheaper than a RT-PCR test in other jurisdictions because it's entirely socialized. And when you would have that system, then people, even in a very poor area, even if they don't have a smartphone or whatever, they're very much willing to work with the contact tracers to report their symptoms and so on, simply because they know there is no social or financial cost in accessing those services. So this is what I mean also by universal broadband and healthcare as a human right, which is why we use the Uber regulation and then work with local cathedral and temples, even if they are not taxi companies to provide socialized transportation service to the remote areas and so on. And, and I can go on, uh, I can go on to 5G spectrum auction design and so on to get the money required to implement such socialized services. But I understand we don't have much time, but I just uh, say I agree with your analysis. Thank you. Indeed, you know, we're, we're almost out of time. So I, I do have a lot of extra questions. I'm sure that people have many questions too, but I think we have to respectful to be respectful about the time that, that, that they agreed on. And I'm sure you have uh, other things that, that um, you're being required. So I want to finish with just one, you know, no, I'm not going to say a question, but, but a little bit of like a, a request, like people in Chile right now, you know, uh, went through a historic election they elected a new constitutional assembly that is going to rewrite the Chilean constitution from scratch. You know, I'm from Chile, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit connected to, to, to that uh, moment. And I wanted to hear what, what your message, what your advice would be. This has been a group that it's, it's very, let's say, unorthodox, you know, like a lot of independent people got elected, you know, into this body uh, that is going to, write the new rules of the game. Chile could change from a presidential system to a parliamentary system. There could be a lot of changes because literally, you know, the, the page, it's blank right now. So in, in that moment, in that opportunity, in that ability to, to basically create a new republic, you know, to start the country again, what would be your, your advice to, to that community from, from afar? Well, I may be influenced by the previous Q&A, so I would say definitely put universal uh, access to education, health and communication and transportation there. Uh, but other than that, uh, I would also say to think about democracy, not just about voting, which is just voting like three bits of information uploaded every four years, every person. And we, we don't need to restrict ourselves now that we're in the broadband first indeed because of pandemic, indeed online first uh, world. Once we have the universal rights guaranteed, we need to make sure that it's a continuous democracy, that people can work meaningfully through presidential hackathons, sandbox application, participatory budget, um, e-petitions, you name it, and effect democratic change um, in real time. And once they do and they see the effect, the change they effect takes place in 24 hours, and it's not about voting for people. It's always about for budget or issues. It's all about prioritization. Once they understand this prioritization is continuous, then a lot of magic of co-creation across sector happens. So increase the bandwidth, the interval. Of Beautiful democracy. message. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, that's something that I also have been, I've been fighting for in, in my own little battles and domains. You know, we actually created a platform to help prioritize issues when, when the whole, um, seen erupted in 2019, which uh, we collected about 7 million preferences from people. And, and it was interesting for about like three or four weeks, you know, it was one of the things that dominated the, the news cycle and participation. But of course, you know, uh, these are, are hard things to, to keep alive, you know, especially in environments that I think are a little bit different institutionally um, and culturally. So 
I think you're a great inspiration to everyone, you know, uh, here, of course, but, but beyond. Um, it has been great to have you here. And I hope that this is not the last time that we get to see each other and that you get to see some of the people that were here today. Uh, I think that the road for digital democracy is long. It's just getting started. And, you know, I, I think it's because of people uh, like you that other people get inspired. They join the cause, they explore new ideas, they write code, they, they put people together. And uh, I want to thank you for, for that. Thank you. And I would say, as I always sign off with, live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper. Okay. Thank you, bye -bye. Audrey. And this is the last seminar of the semester. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And, you know, we'll, we'll be doing a seminar in the fall. But for now, you know, uh, this is it. So thanks for joining us. And goodbye. Live long and prosper again. <laughs> I do it better with the left hand. Okay, bye.